Friends, uh, we take up uh, in this discussion uh, the plays of uh, uh, Ibsen, uh, the Norwegian playwright, uh, who had social themes to pursue and uh, who tried to appeal to the, the ordinary masses, uh, particularly with respect to the views that were important at that time. And uh, you would see that uh, Professor Pahal Nagpal uh, would be applying a general framework of social criticism uh, to the plays of uh, uh, Ibsen, uh, the plays of her choice. And I think through that the discussion will become further concretized. So, Professor Pahal Nagpal, please Thank share you. your thoughts. Uh, so, uh, when we uh, look at Ibsen's work, uh, you know, the kind of plays he had written, so he started writing uh, about 1851 onwards. But they were plays, these plays were both in prose and in verse, such as uh, St. John's Night, uh, then on Icelandic sagas and Viking honor, such as the Vikings at Helgeland. Then it is only about in in about eighteen in the eighteen seventies, which is you know approximately twenty years later. That is middle and most uh, you know is very very uh, proli prolific phase of writing uh, begins with plays like the Pillars of Society, a Dollhouse, uh, Ghosts, an Enemy of the People, and of course to his later phase belong plays uh, such as uh, the Wild Duck and Hera Gapler. Uh, interestingly, James Joyce, while reviewing his last play, When We Dead Awaken, writes about Ibsen and he says he has been upheld as a religious reformer, a social reformer, a Semitic lover of righteousness and as a great dramatist. He has been rigorously denounced as a meddlesome intruder, a defective artist, an incomprehensible mystic and in the eloquent words of a certain English critic, a muckferetting dog. Now, it's very interesting because Ibsen is being, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, Joyce is praising him for, uh, for uh, the kind of ideas that he presented. But we can see the praise and criticism both are at the level of, uh, you know, both content and form. So, he says that through the perplexities of such diverse criticism, the great genius of the man is day by day coming out as a hero comes out amid the earthly trials. So, if we have to understand Joyce's comment on uh, Ibsen, we have to keep in mind performance histories of his plays. And to give you a very, very, just a quick uh, view to this, uh, for instance, if we look at plays such as The Dollhouse and Ghosts, they were, they turned out to be extremely controversial. So, Ghosts was of course rejected by the critics completely of all factions and it had to be performed outside Norway. Uh, so, it premiered in Chicago in Dano Norwegian to a Scandinavian audience. This uh, is very important because this is coupled with the beginning of small theatres where plays could be performed. So, we also associate, you know, these, this cycle of Ibsen's plays with the beginning of a kind of, you know, the little theatre movement uh, that begins, uh, you know, uh, in Europe and other countries. Now, what was it that was so controversial and we were... Uh, discussing how uh, you know the some of uh, the translators demanded a different ending to a play like a dollhouse in which Nora the married woman with children slams the door uh, you know uh, at her husband and walks out ghosts a play that focused on syphilis but interestingly not just uh, I mean the term is not used but the disease is mentioned through it is explained elaborated through its symptoms but more importantly, it is about the disease of inherited tradition. And, uh, and so, and as mentioned that, you know, we are also looking at uh, uh, this change, this transition uh, against the backdrop of a lot of new theatres and theatre movements that were coming, everything from the Freebune in Berlin to the independent theatre in London, to the work of Stanislavski and uh, so on and so forth. Now, if we look at this quotation uh, from, uh, you know, A Doll's House, uh, it's important. Uh, she, she refers to Helma, Torvald uh, Hel Helma, with whom he, she has spent so many years in marriage. She refers to him as a stranger. So, the series of events have made her feel so alienated from her husband that she finds him to be a stranger and says that she cannot take anything from a stranger. 
and so uh, she says there would have to be the greatest miracle of all if at all she were to stay back in this marriage and nora says that you know both of us would be so changed and uh, you know she says she does not believe in miracles any longer and helmer is fine he finds it very difficult to believe that the woman who had been staying with him all this while and had brought up the children and so on has finally decided to call it quits and she wants to step out that our life together uh, could be a real marriage and helmer at the end of it you know just uh, calls out to nora and is now going to wait if at all that's the indication the greatest miracle of all and it's just left as a fragment and you know also for the audience to think that how is it that this kind of an institution is going to work but more importantly the last stage instruction which is from below comes the noise of a door slamming which means that nora has walked out now a doll house was published in 1879 and it premiered in uh, again in uh, first in copenhagen and stockholm and so on now um, uh, krishna sen has pointed out how it was the german translation that created a real furor ibsen it seems was forced to provide a happy ending to the play in which nora reconciles to helmer something that was absolutely against the grain of the play and uh, you know uh, ibsen himself refer to this as a barbaric outrage to the play but why was it that ibsen also kind of gave in to you know this particular change and this happened in the case of the german translation and to quote ibsen here he says to prevent another translation or adaptation of the play with a different ending i sent for use in an emergency the draft of an altered ending by which nora does not leave the house i myself described this alteration to my german translator as a barbaric outrage against the play what is very important here is not this not just about the change that is made but the fact that the audience could not accept the idea of a married woman with children walking out of the door it's very interesting that not only uh, are we looking at a doll house as the voice of modernity here and ibsen's writing is the voice of modernity but we are looking at a and a play that we can straight away call a feminist play we are looking at a play in which the woman is asserting herself rejecting the institution of marriage because she wants to step out and find out and discover life for herself um here i'd request professor prakash to please share his views on a doll house uh i think you know the drama uh, that way enters the very uh, knowledge field of, uh, of the of the world of the society about which it is writing and uh, if uh, uh, mores and morals of society are questioned uh, particularly by people you know who uh, who are at the receiving end of uh, uh, when all the time that is women then no, uh, they will not tolerate it particularly in the 19th century because that was the first attack perhaps on the male uh, community as males and uh, it was there in germany as, as as you say where this kind of uh, an outcry came and uh, people uh, compelled ibsen to change his ending and uh, ibsen hitting back by saying that this was a barbaric act so definitely a uh, uh, barbarism is there in society and if somebody points it out uh, and and the, the same barbarism then you know uh, says that uh, no this will not be allowed on the stage then then i think the purpose of drama is served drama is supposed to show a kind of mirror to society and when society sees its own face and doesn't like it and breaks the glass then nobody is hurt except the society itself so i think it's a, it, it's very significant in the case of uh, 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 ibsen that he was able to uh, arouse this kind of a protest from 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 the german uh, people and it will be the middle class mainly uh, which believes which, which which is steeped in the morality so called of marriage and uh, all those things you know that that refer to orthodoxy tradition uh, a, a kind of customary uh, uh, suppression of females uh, that when that is called to question that, that then people uh, would uh, compel the writer to do so but the, the, if you are uh, criticizing somebody for for something that uh, somebody is showing the, the 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 truth about them then 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 the point has been made i i think uh, this makes uh, the playwright very relevant 
that he is able to diagnose the disease and the patient says, sorry, you are wrong. So, the doctor is called wrong and, 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 and the patient is uh, 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 said to uh, give a kind of judgment on the uh, diagnosis of the doctor. In fact, I think the play resonates so, I mean, it is truly a modern play in that sense because uh, it resonates well with the times and even today, I, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a play that would be uh, accepted, uh, you know, very easily. And again, when we move to the other play by Ibsen, which is, uh, you know, uh, Ghosts, uh, again in this play, uh, you know, we, we see a similar reaction. But before we move there, it's very important when we look at Nora's character, she says something very interesting. She says how she has actually been, you know, under her likes and dislikes were determined by her father. And then when she got married, suddenly she had to <coughs> take in the likes and dislikes of the husband. For instance, uh, she really wants to eat macaroons, but you know he's not allowing her to eat macaroons because her teeth will get spoiled. So how uh, you know she's her life is totally determined by the figure of the husband, and she cannot exercise her choice. Of course, Nora asserts herself in small ways by you know continuing to eat the macaroons, and that itself is uh, considered uh, to be uh, you know uh, deviating from the norm. But uh, towards the end of the play. She, her realization that this figure of the husband is a complete stranger to her and her life and she says that there can be absolutely no bridge anymore and uh, if at all they have to be together, they have to explore life on entirely different terms. When we look at another play by Ibsen which is Ghosts and uh, again if we look at both the theme and the response to this play, it's very significant here. And uh, William Archer, of course, in Ghosts and Gibberings, uh, has compl uh, compiled, you know, the vid uh, gibberings, uh, different virulent responses to the play. For instance, uh, the play uh, was called an abominable play, an open drain, a loathsome sore unbandaged, uh, most damned and repulsive uh, production. Uh, the Lloyds uh, called it a piece to bring the stage into disrepute and dishonor. The gentlewoman called it a wicked nightmare. And um, it's interesting, to be an Ibsenite itself was to be a dissenter. So the question to be asked is, why was it that, you know, a play like A Dollhouse, uh, you know, was uh, got a kind of reaction where people demanded that the ending uh, be changed. And I think within the next couple of years, the play had been translated into many languages and there were these uh, bolderized versions, there were different versions of the play. At the same time, where at least a dollhouse was received in a well received, but uh, Ghosts was completely detested because um, it was a play that told the world that what we call tradition, what one inherits is, is like a disease and the answers lie in change, the answers lie in modernity and uh, it's interesting to mark that the play could be performed in Norway only much later. The, the first premiere was, the premiere was in Chicago in uh, 1882 uh, as mentioned in uh, Dino Norwegian. To my mind, uh, I think uh, at that point of time, uh, the orthodoxy uh, situated very firmly uh, in, in the family structure and uh, the, the, the family, the marriage, and, and you know stability of society through it. Uh, that was the uh, uh, theme that was uh, all the time uh, proved to be a raw nerve and, and if a writer you know touched uh, this particular nerve the, the, the uh, you know uh, oppression of oppressive nature of the, the family and marriage then people would revolt. Uh, but there is a, there, uh, I, I think in one sense uh, uh, attacking the family and society uh, and, the, and the marriage uh, institution is very a political act in the 19th century. Because uh, you, you, you cannot uh, form an opinion outside the family, uh, otherwise people will not allow you to, to speak at all. Therefore, Ibsen, I think, took to these two structures uh, on which, you know, the social stability stood. So, uh, Absolutely. And in fact, another important factor that he brings in is the idea of duty. Oh. And mm. he, he says, if we look at Nora's, uh, you know, the, the way in which he uh, presents Nora and the way uh, we have, of course, uh, Helen Alwing, because he says that once he had created Nora, he could not stop there. I think, in a sense, when he responds to uh, all these people demanding a different ending, that's where Ghosts comes in, mm -hmm. in the sense that if Nora had decided to stay back, 
what would life be life would be pretty much what mrs alving was uh, kind of undergoing mm. and it's interesting that you know helen alving is presented as mrs alving and you know how she carries the burden of marriage and her role as a married woman and um, uh, the idea of duty is very uh, seriously uh, critiqued in this particular play uh so i i i completely agree with you and when we say that his work brings brings in modernity then it's these ideas of uh, equality and uh you know a critique in a sense of the existing social structures such as that of marriage are central in a sense to ibsen's work so um for for instance in a play like ghosts mrs alving's reading of books is something that pastamanders who of course uh, represents religion he finds ob- it's uh, absolutely objectionable and uh, that becomes you know an important point of entry in a sense uh, for the viewer for the reader and uh, so uh, if we just take a look at uh, what he has to say um, he says uh, mrs alving says well uh, she reads all these books because and these books could be anything these books could be books on rationality on the woman question anything so she says I find it clarifies and reinforces so many ideas I've been thinking out all to myself. And she says that in you know there's really nothing new here but what most pe- people think and believe. Only she says most people either don't formulate it to themselves or else keep quiet about it. So reading gives her the confidence to formulate her opinion and to speak about it. this might be a point that you know might not catch one's attention but is very very central to the creation of the new woman really speaking and especially a woman who has stayed back within you know an institution that is no longer working so she asks manders you know what is it that you object to in these books and he says you surely do not suppose that i have nothing better to do than to study such publications as these so uh, mrs alving of course very uh, wittily says that you know uh, you know nothing of what you are condemning so this idea of uh, condemning new writing of condemning new literature and who is condemning it people who are in a sense in charge of tradition who are who are passing it on they are the ones who are condemning it in a sense without reading and without even associating and with it and see their language the kind of words that they use you 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 quoted a whole you know list of the the uh, expletives by, by by people and this is how he was being uh, described by, by by the critics at that time so that shows that, that there there was something somewhere which, which was being heard and uh, libsen knew where to hit he hit at the very roots of uh, uh, dogma and uh, orthodoxy and uh, that dogma and orthodoxy were hidden uh, behind the facade of uh, marriage and uh, uh, family absolutely and you know helen's own realize, realization that her own marriage was actually very transactional mm. you know it it was because the money and so on she finds it very disturbing mm. to be there which is why she wants to in a sense distance herself from the orphanage and uh, really uh, not uh, kind of you know associate with it so uh, uh, and uh, again this idea that she has constantly been tutored and indoctrinated to believe in duty is something that she finds very very uh, repulsive now and uh, very disturbing and we can see this is common to both nora and uh, you know uh, uh, mrs alving because nora too realizes that you know she believed what the pastor had told her and similarly helen is also in a sense you know at that one point when she wanted to walk out uh it is religion it is tradition that holds her back that keeps her within you know the uh, institution of uh, marriage and tells her that this is what duty is all about and to quote helen alving here she says that you know you when you made me give in to what you call duty and obligation what you praised as right and proper that's when she says i started going over your teachers uh, teachings seam by seam i just wanted to pull out a single thread but after i had worked it loose the whole design fell apart so the very fact that the moment you pose a question and this is what ibsen's plays do they pose a question to the existing structures so that when you pull at a single thread the entire structure collapses which is why such a virulent response to the performance of ibsen's plays people absolutely did not want this because this kind of a 
critique of the times this kind of a questioning of the important aspects you know what people believed in through tradition was something that ibsen questioned and showed that this was flawed completely flawed and should be rejected and it is the women who are rejecting it that in a sense is a very important point uh, it also to comes to my mind that uh, this kind of uh, sharp criticism of these institutions uh, and the understanding of ibsen Uh, of of these institutions and and, and their role uh, this turns him quite naturally to to the socialist idea he becomes a socialist yes. he becomes a political writer he starts uh, writing plays like enemy of the people and uh, the, where you know one one is talking about the whole city uh, you know be, being being uh, uh, you know a carrier of the, the, the dirt and the filth that that is under the city that that uh, enemy of the people and uh, interestingly you, you you of course told me uh, once i think and uh, uh th- there were political films made on places like this yes. uh, even in hindi in the in in, in the 1940s yes. uh, chetan anand you know nicha nagar yes. comes to mind yes. that was an enemy of the people so i think if you critique these institutions uh, sharply then a kind of background is made to your political ideas absolutely in fact to uh, add to what you're saying i think uh, if we look at all these plays the minor characters are very important so you know where we have mrs lin in um, a doll house and we we have regina in um, mm. uh, ghosts mm. and you know she comes from the uh, you know ordinary uh, class of people and uh, it's not just that uh, regina is a half sister to uh, uh, oswald but the fact that at the end of the play she rejects it she says you know why should she be taking care of uh, the family and however flawed her model of the uh, joy of life because she is uncertain she knows that she is going to be exploited by ongstrad but however flawed that model might be she sees it as an assertion and she sees it as liberating in that moment where she at least rejects the elite bourgeois structure that the alving household offers to her and that is a very uh, i think a very complex understanding really speaking of um, uh, red, uh, you know the, the idea of the joy of life and of regina's character what would you uh, think about uh, you know the the characterization in a sense of uh, no, it's regina a, it's, a, it's a good insight that uh, uh, even though uh, some of the traditional people are at the center of uh, these plays uh, some of the minor characters constitute the future of uh, no, not just art but also society and these minor characters will finally come up together and and they will have a different understanding of the society in which they live so that will def, uh, work you know to, to, to the advantage of uh, the struggle that might be going on i'm not sure about what was happening in society in norway at that time but i'm sure that uh, people were becoming restless uh, uh, you know under the weight of uh, 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 these people uh, who were bound uh, you know in in their own way by by the traditional religious by by the idea of transcendentalism and all those things yes and uh, ibsen's uh, very very rational uh, presentation through the genre of the drama does of course great service to the genre of the drama but also presents a very very realistic picture uh, to the society so you know fiction has already seen many decades of realism mm. but uh, in drama it only begins with ibsen Mm-hmm. and uh, this idea of providing in a sense of a complex cross section of the different social groups and their problems the way in which they respond uh, i i think uh, that is suggested very clearly and it's interesting that uh, you know the sense of the ending of a play it's not never a finality really speaking because nora slams the door and walks out is a moment and what happens after that it's it's like you know the world is out there she has to explore and find she, out she, she enters the world she, she, she meets world. her people yes. they, they they look at her they they, they uh, learn from, let the lessons from her uh, they, they uh, she shares her experiences with them and, and and the world is then threatened further and and similarly in ghosts the sun the sun the desire for light the desire for light is also the desire for change mm-hmm. and what is going to be he's not being didactic that's the important point and he's not uh, giving us these ready solutions because i think somewhere ibsen is saying that these solutions are something that people need to think about mm-hmm. and the answers are certainly you know as he's uh, at one point said that they're going to come from the common people 
and uh, these are not answers that can be uh, made uh, you know they can can be no ready made answers uh, really speaking to it in fact you rightly uh, framed this uh, particular part by saying you know that he makes people aware about the problem yes uh, he gives them the knowledge he gives them the analysis and uh, what they do in, in order to take care of the problems that is up to them their their potentialities their 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 you know, inventiveness whatever form they take in order to fight the challenges that exist at that time uh, that is not the uh, dramatist's purpose at all his purpose is to present so to just show them where they stand how they suffer things as they are and the endings in in this sense are really speaking beginnings beginnings so and okay. where they will lead is is something that you know at the time people would have had to decide one one example i can give where it will lead uh, bernard shaw would read uh, ibsen yes. quite late in life but then he'll write that famous book called the quintessence, uh, the, the, the quintessence of, ibsenism. of ibsenism and uh, his social criticism owes a great deal to to ibsen and uh, shaw in his own uh, characteristic way uh, would avoid the reference but then he uh, paid a tribute to him by uh, writing a whole book on him in fact which is why it is said that to be an ibsenite meant to be a dissenter yes and uh, mm. you know all factions with all factions rejecting it and it's very interesting because this is the time also with the little theater you know i mean the smaller theaters were kind of you know uh, becoming very important and a lot of these plays could then be performed somewhere it is not as if one had to really speaking rely on the established uh, structures uh, for performances of this sort so there can be many questions today i mean in the 21st century we can pose many questions about you know why ibsen wrote in a particular way and uh, you know why is it that uh, uh, you know uh, there is uh, for instance a very closed uh, set and you know there is little interaction with the audience there can be many uh, questions posed but the important uh, point here is a kind of social realism that begins uh, with uh, you know ibsen's plays and that is a very important thing that we carry over into the 20th Uh, century so ibsen's uh, over of plays is very very important for this reason so uh, friends uh, we've had a discussion uh, on uh, ibsen's plays and uh, ibsen uh, became a household name not just in europe but in many other countries also where different social movements were on and uh, his plays were being uh, you know used uh, their versions were were, were done by uh, people in different languages he was translated Uh, greatly in many languages of the world and that's what a dramas uh, or, or dramatic uh, action uh, uh, work is supposed to be so i think you had a very useful and insightful discussion today and please mull over these questions and uh, just apply these things to the other play, plays that you have in your course so uh, thank thank you very much professor naik punagpal for giving such a uh, you know comprehensive uh, uh, analysis of uh, ibsen his social role his his his, his, his dramatic prowess and uh, things that are associated with it thank you